After a mediocre February, I was fed up and angry. Is March better? Let's talk about it. What's up, Fleek fans? Welcome back to the channel. Another monthly tier list. This time I saw 15 brand new, somewhat new releases. We're going to talk about all of them. Put them in order. You know what we always do. Hey, let me know down below. Do you like this green screen thing more or what I usually do? Drop your comments and leave your likes and... I don't know. What's your MySpace? If you're nice, I'll put you in my top five friends. You can replace my wife. Jack Dello! Oh, good evening, Night Owls, and thank you for allowing me into your living rooms once again. We're gonna start strong today. This is a movie that hasn't left my brain since I saw it. That is Late Night with the Devil. Happy Easter, everyone! Let's talk about Satan. Listen, David Desmalchin did an incredible job, but really two separate performances because of who he is on this late night talk show and behind the scenes uh, where we explore this guy's life so heavily in the beginning and then we basically get a live episode of his show, the last episode of Jack Delroy's career. And the way that they capture the late 70s here is fascinating. And really, the horror doesn't start in the beginning. It's a Halloween episode, so there's some weirdos on his talk show, and he's playing the late night host brilliantly, but deep down in his mind, well, because of what happened in his past, he has to get those ratings back up. He once again has to be at the top, and he'll do anything to make sure that he is. And the way this episode plays out, unlocking a very secret malevolent force is just awesome to watch. Now, is the budget low, and can you tell it's a little low at times? Yeah, absolutely. What they do in the third act with the uh, electric shock powers and some of the body horror does come across as a little bit cheesy, but I found, and I don't know if this is the case for a lot of other people, I found the actual final sequence is what really brought the entire movie together, and I somewhat forgave the cheesiness of that last crazy event because it all came together so beautifully, and this is one that I sat with for quite a while afterwards, and I, I, I had to really think about and deep dive on what I watched, and it all came together so beautifully. A lot of that through the final sequence, but really through Delroy's story, how they start the movie, how they end the movie, and then just getting a peek of perspective into this live show, man. This is a great independent feature. And yeah, a lot of the talk was surrounding the AI, three to four different frames of the film. And do I wish they would have used that? No, they're a studio with millions of dollars. They have money. They could have hired somebody. But do I want that to tarnish the movie itself? No, because of the experience, the creativity behind it. So I'm putting Late Night with the Devil on the great tier, but really high great tier. Very close to awesome. That's me, Megamind, master of all villainy. Until I realized my destiny was to be a superhero. Megamind 2. It's the biggest piece of dog shit. I keep saying this. If I could go back in time and tell myself, Austin, the sequel to Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey is going to be better than the sequel to Megamind, I would think, man, this guy's crazy. He looks good, though. <laughs> This movie is the epitome, the epitome of laziness, bringing a character back from the dead. We thought Megamind was done and gone. And really, I always say, if a sequel comes out or a reboot comes out and it's bad, it's horrible, we still have the original. And nothing's going to take away from that original. But I think I might make an exception with Megamind 2, because Megamind 2 not only was just a disaster in its own right, I have no will to go back and watch the original Megamind now. And I really, really like that first movie. It has a lot of nostalgia, but it's also just a high quality superhero slash supervillain film. And there's something about replacing the entire voice cast and using this straight television animation style. But even then, I've seen, I've seen shows on KET that look so much better than this move. Austin, what's KET? Kentucky Educational Television. They can't even get the volume of the local commercials right, and they look better than Megamind 2. The voice cast, they're, they're like off-brand versions of the original, but in a way that makes them terrible, in a way that makes them okay. But the animation, the animation's unfinished. I'm not kidding. There is a scene uh, when they're doing the dance thing at the nightclub where there are characters in the background that aren't fully rendered. That is not a joke. If you haven't watched this movie, don't ever watch it, but take me, uh, take my word for it. This animation is not fully finished. It's just annoying from start to finish. You know, my wife and I are about to go mulch our flower bed in the front yard. I would rather do that for eight hours than watch this movie again. I, I deserve torture 
for putting myself through this. This is ridiculous. Let's put it on the awful tier. Is there a lower tier? Well, I'm not going to be the dragon warrior anymore. You will advance to spiritual leader of the Valley of Peace. Inner peace. Kung Fu Panda 4. Yeah, 4. This movie's doing really well. It's making lots of money. This is a beloved franchise. Jack Black is amazing. I love Jack Black. I just couldn't really get invested in this specific story. It just feels like a franchise that is kind of by the numbers at this point. You know what you're getting with the characters and the storyline, and you're going to feel some heart. The voice performances are fantastic, although they didn't bring back certain characters. I guess they kind of did, but certain characters that we know from the other movies, and I'm just like, where are they, and why aren't they here? And I, I can feel myself missing them, so that was a strange decision. I kind of like what they're doing with the villain here. Can shapeshift, turn into anyone. Poe's journey is uh, touching. It really is, because now he's going from this big warrior to kind of the man, or the panda. And as always, it's a role that he doesn't know if he can fill the shoes of. And that's a that's a touching story. And again, it has all of the things that make some of these DreamWorks movies really, really good. But it's surrounded by a shell of familiarity and generic storytelling. But more importantly, I think this is one kids are going to enjoy. You can take your family to. That's very important. And it's not Megamind 2. And because of that, it's going on the OK tier. The Prince. We need this. Damsel. Millie Bobby Brown. You know, she recently came out and said she doesn't watch movies because she just can't sit there for that long. I kind of get it, but only when we're talking about Damsel. <laughs> <laughs> Got it! Oh, man. TikTok, it's cooking people's brains. But whatever. It's none of my business. Who cares? Honestly, who cares about any of this? I... I... <laughs> <laughs> That's a story of a princess who gets thrown in a pit and she has to find her way out of the hole and she makes friends with a dragon who kills her father. Uh, some things in there that could have been explained or at least, you know, told a bit differently because it's like, why are they why are they working together? Shouldn't she be upset? I do like these isolated stories and when she's trying to escape from the inner tunnels of this dragon cave, it was kind of interesting, but after a while the story just got kind of boring and stale and some of the decision making, the fact that this army can't take down a dragon, but she can through certain things that happen that I'm like, all right, I get it. Suspension of disbelief, but they waste really talented supporting actors and Bobby Brown as much as people are giving her flack right now, she's really good in this movie. She is. I think she's genuinely great. And I had a lot of people in my comments defend her. Clearly just there to defend her. Not there to talk about the movie. Just there because they're huge fans of Millie Bobby Brown. And if that's the case, you win your argument because she's very good in this movie. But the movie is not good. So Damsel is in distress in the bad tier. I had such good memories here. Maybe my happy place can be our happy place. I left you all alone down here. How about imaginary? Yeah, so this one's not good. This is, I, Blumhouse, oftentimes they give us really good horror movies. And then other times they give us crap. I mean, just pure, unadulterated crap. And I'm like, Blumhouse, what are we doing? I love Jason Blum. I just think sometimes they take these projects that are clearly not good. And other times they're taking creative risks. And I'm like, do that more often. And when I first saw the trailer for Imaginary, I'm like, oh, it's trying to be Megan. Or it's trying to be Chucky. Or it's trying to be the idea of an imaginary friend coming to life. But through the first 45 minutes of this movie, it's none of that. It's just this boring story about this family and you get some jump scares and there's some really cheap jump scares because some things are going on with this bear, but they're focused more on this uninteresting, boring family. And I'm just like, I did, what is the focus of this movie and the cheap feeling jump scares just scattered throughout this film? I was, I was so bored while watching this movie. I started to imagine that I was in a different theater watching a different film. I'm bummed I didn't initially review this. I ended up watching it a little later, just trying to catch up on some March movies, and I regret watching it because I didn't care about any of these characters, any of these jump scares. It, it's really bad. <laughs> I guess I'll give it some props for some interesting imagery at times, and the finale was much more entertaining than the beginning, but that's about all I can say about it. That's good. Uh, this movie goes on the bad tier. Very close to awful, but not quite Megamind. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Come on. How about Immaculate, starring Sidney Sweeney? And a lot of people were talking about the way this movie ends and the fact that, you know, if you are if you have a fear of having kids, don't watch this movie, don't watch the ending. And I can, I can very much see that. My wife, she just gave birth recently, and I would tell her to never watch this movie, even though she loves horror films, and she would probably enjoy it. Well, at least enjoy the second half, because this film begins in such a slow, dreary familiar you know once she makes herself at home here they montage through certain things and uh, you know eventually the mystery starts to creep in something's going on behind the scenes and she's trying to figure out what it is but it's so obvious where it's going to go and so personally i can feel the mystery but maybe other people are and everybody's talking about the ending and the way that it ends really the way this entire final 25 minutes goes really elevated the experience for me but it didn't quite get it to good because I just wasn't feeling the story prior to things getting interesting. And even when they got interesting, I saw exactly who and what was behind what was actually going on. And so I can't really put Immaculate above the meh tier, but I see why people liked it, I guess. The Nikki, what up, man? Are you serious? Have someone call me when you get out of surgery, all right? You should drive out there. Ricky's been there for you guys your whole lives. Ricky Stanicki. This is from the award-winning director of Green Book. Everybody gives Green Book such a hard time. I think it's fine. Peter Farrelly did a nice job with that movie. It's a crowd-pleasing film. Yeah, there are some things in there. I think it's more like a film Twitter thing than it is a general audience thing. Because every time I talk to anyone outside of that space, they're like, yeah, I love Green Book. And I didn't love Green Book. I didn't think it should have won Best Picture. But it's not bad. That's my opinion! That being said, I'm not going to sit here and say I expected more from Ricky Stenicki because it's from an Oscar-winning director. No, I saw this trailer. I knew exactly what this movie was. I just think there's a lot of raunchy humor, a lot of dick jokes in this movie. And there's that's fine. There is a limit, though, on how many you can do without just wearing out your welcome and becoming unfunny after a while. And this movie wears out its welcome after, like, 30 minutes. But... I think Zac Efron's really good at comedy. John Cena's in his element here. He's really funny. Those two characters make this somewhat of an entertaining comedy, but at the end of the day, I didn't laugh more than I laughed, and I had no interest in the story whatsoever after an hour of this film. So I'm going to go Ricky Stenicki on the meh tier, but it wasn't terrible. My advice. Find a reason to be here that's bigger than you are. I read the back of this family in the paper. I think this is it. So this movie technically came out in February, but I finally watched it and it released on demand in March. So I'm going to put it on my list, but only because I liked it. I thought it was really heartfelt and emotional. And I'm in a place right now with my daughter that this really just kind of hit me hard, man. You know, it's all about where you're at in your life. And maybe I wouldn't have liked this as much a year ago, but now... I really, really liked it. You have Alan Richson. He just lost his wife. His daughter's going through something terrible. And Hilary Swank, her character just comes out of nowhere and says, hey, we're going to help pay these ridiculous and insane bills. And we're going to try our best to get you through this tough financial situation. It also takes place in Kentucky. So, and it's a true story. A lot of these things just lined up perfectly for me to really like this movie. And guess what? It takes place in Louisville, Kentucky. She said Louisville right. It's not Louisville. It's not Louisville. No one says that. Louisville? You might as well just say that. Just sounds stupid. It's Louisville. And if you come to Kentucky and say anything else, we're going to judge you really harshly. But Hillary Swank nailed it. You know, I haven't been as impressed with Hillary Swank as of late. This is one of her better performances. This is a really good performance. And Alan Richson is great. My God, the emotion. People are like, I don't know if he can play Bruce Wayne. I know he can play Batman. Don't know if he can play Bruce Wayne. If he brings the same acting chops that he brought in this movie, the guy can play Bruce Wayne. The guy's walking around. He nails the accent. He's got a Kentucky hat on. I felt like I was watching somebody. Now, it, it takes place many years ago, but I felt like I was watching somebody I know. I'm sorry. When something takes place in Kentucky, I have to. The ending is very cliche, and it's almost kind of silly, but then when you go look at the true story, most of it actually happened. And so you're like, wow, it is silly, but they're doing a good job of making it the true story that it is. So I am going to go Ordinary Angels as conventional as the story is is on the good tier. I thought they told the true story well. You talked to your dad recently? Why? How about Love Lies Bleeding, starring Kristen Stewart, directed by Rose Glass? This is an A24 movie with so much 
style to it. And I love a film that is all about two people who get caught up in some crazy stuff and they have to figure out how to get out. Because you have Lou's dad, played by Ed Harris, who's caught up in some crazy stuff. Jackie comes along, played by Katie O'Brien, who is awesome. I mean, my God, that she could beat me up, man. <laughs> what do you mean by that? But I think it does a nice job exploring their relationship. But as they get deeper into this chaos and keep making these bad decisions that are uh, influencing them to go in the wrong direction, and then by the time you get to the end, you're like, man, they, they are really stuck in the mud, and I don't know how they're going to get out. But there's a decision made at the end of this movie that I wasn't the biggest fan of. They go for something here that I appreciate looking back, but uh, while I'm watching and, and even, you know, kind of reflecting on the experience, I do feel as if the ending kind of, it didn't tarnish anything, but I didn't feel like I got the finality that I deserved as a viewer going on this lengthy journey with them. And I say lengthy, it's not really that lengthy, uh, but there were some issues with pacing as we were going. All in all, I think the style is incredible. I believe the performances are awesome and I really enjoyed Love Lies Bleeding. That's why I'm going to go good tier for this film. On behalf of the Eurospace program, 189 days into your solo journey. Spaceman, starring Adam Sandler. Shampoo is better, I go on first and clean the hair. Yeah, he's not that Adam Sandler in this movie. This is not the Adam Sandler, Happy Madison Productions, uh, Netflix film starring Adam Sandler, and he hasn't really had one of those in a while. Well, I guess Murder Mystery 2 was kind of that. I forgot about that one, but Hustle was really good. I think Spaceman misses the mark. It does. But you also have a really competent director that has worked on projects like Chernobyl, so I think that's part of the reason why this doesn't fall flat. I just found the storytelling to not be as interesting as I needed it to be. I love the chemistry even though they're not on screen together, between Paul Dano and Adam Sandler. Dano's Hanush and Sandler's Jakob provide the best scenes in the film when they're on that spaceship together. And whatever your conclusion is on whether or not Hanush is real, uh, that should have been the focus of the story. And it kind of is, but then you have Carrie Mulligan's love interest, and I just didn't really feel that side. I think they try to flesh it out as we go. We get these flashbacks, but I wasn't really feeling that side of the story. And so unfortunately, I found a little less than half of this to fall flat and the other half of it to be awesome uh, but the ending was touching and kind of mesmerizing so all in all i think this goes on the okay tier but it definitely could have and should have been better is there a hospital nearby is it like too far about like 25 minutes i'd say uh, i just slapped you are you all right what <laughs> roadhouse so i think a lot of people are getting upset with this film because it obviously isn't nearly as entertaining or fun or knows what it is as much as the original Roadhouse. And then you have, uh, you know, Conor McGregor in here and some people are like, ah, he's not that good in the movie. I thought he was playing Conor McGregor. So, I mean, what more could you really want from him? It's not like you have a Hall of Fame actor in there. Uh, but, yeah, he was fine. I like the fight scenes between he and Gyllenhaal. I think Gyllenhaal's commitment to this role really brought a lot to the movie. Unfortunately, his version of this character is nowhere near as interesting as Swayze's version. And because they try to make this stand out from the original Roadhouse by making it different, which I appreciate, by the way, uh, they also make it more cliche and more familiar in the process. And at a point, I'm like, am I watching a Fast and Furious movie? Or is this the Roadhouse reboot? Which one is it? Roadhouse. Pick a lane, fellas. It got ridiculous. It did. But I like the combat scenes. I think Joan Hall's charming or not charming. I don't know what he is in this movie. Is he the villain? I think he might be the villain. I still had an okay time, to be honest. I think people are being too harsh on this. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm also not the biggest original Roadhouse fan because I don't have nostalgia for it. Maybe that's it. It's still a lot better than this. How are you feeling? Good, I think. Do you recall anything from the session? Focus. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2, I can't believe I'm saying this, is so much better than the first Blood and Honey. You know how I feel about that. If you watch my review, I thought that was atrocious. Just the worst thing ever. I wanted to rip my hair out one by one as I was watching. Hey, take it easy. Thankfully, that's not the case with this one. I can't believe I'm saying this. I had fa fa fa. Fa, fa, fa. Fun? 
<laughs> well, certain moments were fun when the gore fest is happening on screen. It works really well as a B movie slasher, by the way. But when it starts to lose me is when it tries to get serious and emotional, and we've got Christopher Robin's thing going on where he's trying to deal with all the emotional trauma and stress from the first movie. They recast him, by the way. This guy's a lot better than the other guy. Uh, but they should have just leaned less into that and more into the incredible gore. Do the bear traps get kind of repetitive? Sure, but they also work around the budget in certain ways. The uh, the scene in the nightclub, while excessive nudity for some reason, it's like they had to put it in there. It was weird. Uh, but the way that they played with those kills, that was actually creative. I can't believe I'm putting the word creative and blood and honey in the same sentence, but I don't hate this movie whatsoever. Do I think it's good? No, but... It's still a big step up from the first because it's not garbage. So let's put this one on the mat here. We're going to need all the help we can get. Let's get to work. It's all dark and horny at 12 o'clock. So I had somebody say in the comments, Austin, you gave Ghostbusters a five, but Godzilla and Kong a six, even though they're both fun blockbuster sequels. You only like Godzilla and Kong because it's a bigger movie. How is that even applicable? I don't even understand. Why are we even comparing these two movies? They're nothing alike. Oh, maybe it's because they both have Empire in the title. Maybe. And I don't even hate the new Ghostbusters. I think there's some really nice, charming things about it. The way they utilize the older cast, which, again, I don't know if they were necessary, to be honest with you, but they're good in the movie. And then the new cast, they're kind of pushed to the background in certain moments. Finn Wolfhard's character doesn't have anything to do in this movie. And there are just so many things at play. Kumel Nanjiani and all of these new cast members and then the OG cast and then the people from the first movie. And then you've got to make time for Paul Rudd, which... I'm glad they do, because he's like the best new Ghostbuster. He may be one of my favorite Ghostbusters in general. And McKenna Grace is nothing but charm and charisma. I love her. But again, the story is just so cliche. And then the Frozen Empire doesn't really do anything or mean anything until the final 20-ish minutes of the movie. And the rest of it is just kind of things happening and a slow buildup and I wasn't really all that interested and there's too much going on in this movie and again I made this comparison not as bad as the new Jurassic World but they are still kind of relying on that nostalgia so I definitely didn't hate this I think a lot of fans liked it more than me but I'm not the most hardcore Ghostbusters guy in general so I just found this to be another meh sequel that being said it's still meh it's not bad I thought it was you know fine I mean it's all right like the Titans were the guardians of nature. And the great apes. It's sort of kind of how I feel about the new Godzilla and Kong movie. In a way, it's fine, but in another way, it's really entertaining and fun. It's stupid. It's dumb. It's ridiculous. It's over the top. It's schlocky. But that's kind of what fans are wanting to see. And if you want a big WWE match between Godzilla and Kong, well, they're on the same team for most of this movie. Between those guys and Scar King and this other big creature that looks like Godzilla. Can you tell I'm not super, you know, in depth into the lore of Godzilla? I've always been just a super casual fan. It wasn't really until minus one uh, that I started to really care about Godzilla. And even with this movie, I still didn't really care about Godzilla, but I found it to be a really fun film. I did. When we were in Hollow Earth following around Kong, I could have watched two hours of just that. Make that the movie. Why do we need these dumb human characters? Why do we need the Volkswagen commercial? Did you see that in the film? This nice touching moment between two characters and then it's just this commercial shot of a Volkswagen. <laughs> so that's really what I'm talking about when I'm saying the movie is dumb. But the Godzilla and Kong stuff was awesome. The big battles at the end, they were awesome. Did they care about human life? Did a lot of people die? You bet your booty they did, but who cares when we're getting these big wrestling moves between these giant creatures? I thought that was really fun and entertaining, and it saved this movie. It saved this plot, which I didn't care about. So I I'm going to put this one on the OK tier. I had a solid time with it, entertaining time at the movie. That There's definitely flaws, but, you know. It is what it is. It is, it is what it is. And finally, listen, al Kaib. It's only fragments. Nothing's clear. Oh. I love me some Dune. I'm doing it again this weekend. That would be my fourth, fifth time watching now. Fifth time? Wow. 
Okay. And this month has brought me my best times in the theater with Godzilla and Kong and then Late Night with the Devil and and the many, many times that I've watched Dune Part 2. And there is a reason why this tier list looks a little different than normal uh, because I have a designated spot for this film in my heart now, in my soul. And if you would have asked me when Dune Part 1 came out, Austin, I know you really enjoy Dune, but do you think Dune Part 2 can surpass it in the way that I now believe it has. I would have said, maybe, but I just hope Denis Villeneuve does the story justice. There's a lot he has to do and maybe some things he has to change to make it feel like I'm satisfied. And he did that. He did it in a different way than maybe I expected in moments. But my God, he did it. But just an incredible story of a man's rise to power and one that, you know, I still see some people that look at Paul as the hero and I'm like, yeah. I mean, I, part of me can see it, but man, what happens in the final 30 minutes of this movie after he drinks the blue worm piss? It's like this Gatorade. Wait. Nope. No visions for me. Son of a bitch! I'll link my review below. It's above my head. You know how I feel about this movie. I have raved about it and raved about it and tweeted about it. And somebody kept count on my letterbox. They're like, Austin, you've tweeted about Dune 30 plus times. And I think I've done it like 10 times since then. And I'm not done because I love this film. Every ounce of me loves it. It's a cinematic experience like no other. I have only felt this way about a handful of movies over the last two to three years. Oppenheimer, this, uh, Spider-Verse, maybe, The Holdovers, but Dune Part 2, man, it, it may just, it may just surpass everything. So yeah, uh, I don't need to talk about it anymore. All-time tier. Finally, March brought us some great movies. Thank God. It's the best time of the video. Let's rank these movies. Leave your thoughts down below. What movie did I miss? What's your favorite of the bunch? If you enjoyed this monthly tier list and you want to see more, be sure to drop that like down below. Or tell me I need a haircut because I, I just need the motivation. Give me the motivation to get a haircut. At the bottom, yeah, it's Megamind 2. That movie stinks. Followed by Imaginary and then Damsel. We're in the right order right now. On the meh tier... As much as I was impressed by this movie for not being terrible, I am going to put Winnie the Pooh, Blood Honey 2 at the bottom, followed by your boy, Ricky Stanicki. <laughs> Ghostbusters and Immaculate look good in those spots. At the bottom of the OK tier, I'm going to go Kung Fu Panda, uh, still OK, followed by Roadhouse. Roadhouse? Roadhouse. There we go. And then, ooh, this is tough. Oh, this is tough. I don't know, man. <sighs> Yeah, I, I actually had this different, but just because of the entertainment factor and which movie would I watch again, I, I'm going to go Godzilla and Kong above Spaceman. I just, I, I'm changing it on a whim. And this is another one that I, I had in my head a different way. I had Ordinary Angels above Love Lies Bleeding just because, you know, as a father, I related to that story just a bit more. But I do think there's more craft on display in Love Lies Bleeding and the performances are fantastic. So we'll put that in third, Ordinary Angels in fourth, uh, Late Night with the Devil in second, and Dune is the best movie of the year so far. And frankly, it's, it's not even close. I think Late Night with the Devil is finally in the conversation of, yeah, it's one of the best movies, but nothing's close to Dune Part 2. And I, I don't imagine I don't imagine anything being close for a while. All right, thanks for watching. Check out all of my reviews down below and stay tuned. We have plenty of reviews coming this week. Check out some videos right here and I'll see you in the next video.